Councilmember Rice. By the year 2017, those Montgomery County residents working in minimum wage jobs will be making $11.50 per hour. This historic vote by the council is designed to balance the needs of county workers and businesses that are still recovering from the national recession. Mark Elrich is one of the bill's sponsors. You know, I always thought that we ought to be thinking about what this actually means for people trying to put food on the table. And I think at the end of the day, we made a good decision. I would have liked a year earlier, but I think we've really moved in the right direction. I'm really proud of what we've done, and I'm, I'm happy. With the vote, the council precedes action by the state. Governor Martin O'Malley has said he will push to raise the minimum wage during this year's legislative session. In the meantime, neighboring jurisdictions, Prince George's County and the District of Columbia are poised to take similar action. The bill's co-sponsors call it economic justice. I think it's an amazingly historic day for the county and for those residents who have struggled so much, um, especially in a county that we know the cost of living is so high. And although we try every year to strengthen our safety net, we know that the best tool is definitely to put more money in people's pockets. It provides the dignity that they deserve. We have to just step out sometimes on good information and on faith that we came here to do this job. But at the end of the day, we did win a victory on behalf of thousands and thousands of families across uh, our region. Elbridge says by increasing the regional minimum wage, not only will the need for public assistance decline, but more money will be put back into the economy. He says it's a win-win. This is real increases in income, and the more people make, the less public assistance you get. I mean, that's not a theory, that's a fact. Everything we have in this county is on a sliding scale, and so the more you move up the sliding scale, um, the less the government pays and the more you pay, and they're going to net out better off anyway. I mean, it's, it's okay to pay taxes, it's okay to pay for services. It, I would think that everybody, conservative or liberal, would want people to be able to pay for things and not bemoan the fact they're going to get less public assistance. That is a great outcome. You're starting your third season here at Maryland, came from Texas. Tell us what you think of, of Maryland and Montgomery County so far. Well, I love Maryland and I love uh, Montgomery County and I love Bethesda and Kensington and Chevy Chase, the areas I hang out in. Um, been really uh, pleased with the people, been really happy with the uh, school system and the church. We go to Holy Redeemer School and, and church and it's really welcomed us in uh, to the community and um, my wife's happy and that's really what's important. You're dealing with traffic, you're dealing with a lot more people. Was it a tough adjustment? It wasn't as tough as I thought because everybody made traffic sound like it was going to be just nightmarish and I don't like, I, I hate when I miss a stoplight and got to sit there for two minutes so I don't have a lot of patience but um, one fan told me when I moved here the best thing he says coach a lot of people means there's a lot of basketball players here and so whenever I get stuck in traffic I think about there's a lot of players in the area which is good. Coming here after Gary Williams and, and arriving to take over after him you had some shoes to fill obviously but it seems that the population here has really embraced you the students the Originators. You've got, you've really, you know, grasped hold of, of what they love here at Maryland. Uh, how did you do it? Well, one, I just, I tried to be Mark Turgeon instead of Gar Gary Williams, and uh, that's all I know. And, and I think Coach Williams really helped me because he kind of endorsed me uh, from the beginning. So I think that really helped. And then I came to a basketball school, and, you know, they want to win. And so they want to embrace their coach because they want, they want their coach to do well. I know that you are, you played at KU. When did you know that you weren't going to be a pro basketball player, that coaching was your destiny? Well, it's a great story, and I, I know a lot of people have heard it. I sat down with Larry Brown, who was my college coach, and um, after the f my freshman year, and I set an assist record. I thought I was pretty good, and I had long hair and braces and pimples all over my face, and I thought I was it. And he goes, what do you want to do? And I'm like, you kidding me, coach? I'm going to the NBA. I just set the freshman assist record at KU. And he kind of looked at me and says, Turge, you have no chance at playing in the NBA, but I think you'll be a great coach. So it was a real bittersweet moment. I was like, my basketball dreams were crushed but I knew what my future was going to be. So I kind of right then I started thinking about being a college coach, not a high school coach, not a pro coach. I really just thought about being a college coach. And your dad was also a coach. What kind of an influence did he have on you? Well, my dad had a huge influence, more than anybody in my life. Um, he saw a passion in me that I love basketball, something that I had to do almost every day or I, I couldn't function. And um, so he saw that. So he actually started a league in Topeka. 
um, because there wasn't a lot of basketball leagues for kids our age. He started, it went on for years. Whatever day I could do to, to get me around basketball, he did and exposed me. He would take me to NCAA tournament games or just everything to, to make me even want it more. So. Uh, if he had been a, a dad that just cared about himself and not me, I wouldn't be here today. So he was pretty big in my life, obviously. Next year, the Big Ten. Is this a good move for Maryland? Do you think this will be good for the team? Well, I think it's a really good move for the University of Maryland. I think financially, academically, and for our athletic department, it's, 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 a, it's a fantastic move. I think with our standards for academics, we fit right into the Big Ten. Uh, and the paychecks that we're going to get down the road are going to be pretty nice. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's good um, because it's a, one great league to another great league. It's not like we're stepping three leagues down. Uh, Big Ten basketball was the number one league in the country last year. It's talked about being the number one league in, in the country this year, so we're going into another great league. So our goals don't change. We still want to win a national championship, whether we're in the ACC or the Big Ten, and we want to recruit local players and keep them home. Dalton Potter's love of music grabbed him at a young age. My, uh, my mom decided that uh, the uh, choir program at the National Cathedral was a good thing. After that, he never thought about anything but music. So what this is is a cello bow. The cello is the tenor. This is the hair that we use to stimulate the strings. Then at the age of 16, his parish sent him on a mission to Haiti to teach English to a group of students who were in an orchestra there. At that time, there really weren't a lot of avenues to escape poverty in Haiti. What this little uh, orchestra did was they would take handicapped children, then the orchestra would go on tour in the United States and fundraise for these kids back home. It was just, it really just totally moved me and I've, I've had that seed planted so deep. You do it all. Absolutely. So, with a smile. With no, a smile. And after that, he went to work for the Violin House of Weaver, where he made classical guitars and eventually learned how to make violins. In 1996, he started Potter's Violins, and the rest is history. The fact is that the violin business is a very uh, specific trade that has very specific skills that can't be easily duplicated. The learning curve for my employees and is, is really, really long. It's not something you could just hire somebody to work for the summer and, and they take off. Um, but uh, no, I'm very, I'm very humbled by how many people around the country depend on us as their kind of home shop. Even when they move to other parts of the country, they, when they come back to visit, they have us adjust their instruments or maybe they'll bring something and they want to upgrade it and trade it in, go to the next step. The violins that are crafted at Potter's Bethesda shop are created from scratch. Generally making an instrument from scratch, like the, the parts that you see on my bench here, if, if that's all I did, I could make one in a month pretty easily. It's all handcrafted. Each instrument takes weeks of precise workmanship by one of the four luthiers who work at Potter's. Dalton Potter is humble about his success, giving credit to his staff and the personal attention that's given to each of their clients. There's a, a lady in Northern Virginia to have something made for her as a custom instrument. He's actually coming in today to get it adjusted. I think that really what it comes down to is that people are hungry for genuineness. And the music world is a very small one and people talk and they, uh, the word of mouth spreads when you find somebody you really like. Um, basically, I have the very best staff that I think that you can assemble in this country. Dalton Potter grew up in a family of teachers where the awareness of students whose educations were compromised by their lack of resources was something that affected him. Today, he donates several instruments each year to students who express a commitment to the instrument. What I wanted to do was take that kid who might be in challenging circumstances and he finds out from his teacher, if you can play this piece by this time, if you can work hard and get this, Mr. Potter will give you an instrument so you can go to the next level. And that's really what I was after. I wanted to, to light that fire in that little person to make them say, you know what, I can do this. <laughs>